Um, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce to the stage um, a very good friend of mine and someone who has um, supported our business over the last couple of years with lots of advice and friendship and hugs and everything else. And when I went to visit a Symbio business in London, and the owner of that business was saying, you know, the, the, the problem we've got is we don't really know, or we're not great at communicating, right? We've got to tell a story, whether we're looking for investment or we're looking for partners or whatever else, and that's not our natural habitat. Um, and so that gave me the idea for this session, and there was an obvious person to, uh, uh, to ask to uh, execute it for me. So please welcome to the stage, Catherine Sheridan. Hi, you guys saw me before, but I didn't actually introduce myself. So I'm Catherine Sheridan from Sustainability Consult in Brussels. This is storytelling for scientists. So I want you to think about what kind of scientist you are. And even if you're not a scientist, just try to like access one of those profiles of a scientist. How would you define yourself? In popular culture and in the media, we see a lot about the mad scientist, the crazy eccentric. We have Rick and Morty. We have the crazy guys in uh, the Big Bang Theory. And according to you know, what I could find on the internet, the mad scientist is keeping themselves apart from the rest of society. And sometimes that's what we need to do to make things happen. And sometimes that's a bit of a communications challenge. And we've also got you know, the granddaddy of science um, and nature science, uh, David Attenborough. He was 97 on Monday, and he's an institution. I'm British originally, and for us, he's absolutely an institution, you know, the granddaddy. Um, and yet, we're still not really listening to him. And what I think, uh, when I look at climate, I've been in this for, for a couple of decades now. First of all, we were talking about climate mitigation. So like, there is a problem, what are we gonna do about it? And now we're talking, you know, climate emergency. We need to do something now, it's already getting to be too late. And it's actually moving, and what I see in terms of climate influencers, if you like, is uh, talking about collapse. Now, in terms of messaging, that's gone from, we need to act now, to the house is on fire, to real grief and uh, ecological anxiety around the state of the world. Now, Greta, she's a pretty divisive figure for some reason. When I think of her, I still think, 13-year-old girl with pigtails. <laughs> She's 20 now. Um, but maybe, you know, there's something of that activist spirit in what we need to be doing as an industry. But whether you look to Greta or you look to Attenborough, my sense is that no one is listening. Maybe they're listening, but are they acting? And this is the challenge that we face, and this is not abstract to this industry, because we need people to be both listening and taking action. If you're struggling to get through the day, if you're struggling to put food on the table, put your kids through school, deal with a shoddy healthcare system, whatever the challenges are in our daily lives, we might want to do better. We might talk about going green, but actually the effort that it takes and the time investment and the financial investment is still quite challenging for folks. So I think that we're waiting for someone else to do the work for us. Now this is an opportunity for those of us in the room because we can and we need to do the work for them. So let's think of this more as storytelling for activist scientists and whether you relate to the idea of being an activist or not. If you are in this sector, we are trying to change things. You may be uh, on the data side, you may be on the technical side, but stuff that you pass through to marketing, to the management, it is what is communicated about your company. And so we are in an activist space, or we could be. So what about me? Why am I here? Why am I talking about bio? It's not just that you know I give Paul hugs when he needed them, which was the introduction. Um, I've been in this industry for 15 years. Um, I started out as a journalist on the EU environmental side and also some global environmental stuff. And I set up my firm, Sustainability Consult, 15 years ago. And I've done quite a lot of representing for the industry. I think I'm not a typical consultant in that way. I've gone out on my own dime and on my own time over and over again advocating for the industry from, from TEDx to sustainable brands to you know, a bunch of global things. 
actually, I had a pretty good gig in sustainability communications. When I set up my firm, it was as an anti-greenwashing firm to do sustainability communications. So how did I get into this whole bio business? I'm not even a scientist. So why did I get into bio? Why do I believe in bio? Well, I think that bio is part of the solution. It's certainly not the only solution. We're kidding ourselves if we think that. But it is a real opportunity to make change. And it's something concrete. When I talk to people, even like policy journalists, when I talk to people about bio and journalists about bio, we're basically saying, we have this one thing, it's not good. We have this other thing, it's better. You don't have to be a scientist to understand that. Product A, not so good. Product B, considerably better. Exchange A. You know, we get that. One of the leading climate philosophers, Paul Hawkin, he says one of the mistakes that we've made in climate science is describing climate change as a future existential threat. I already talked about how people struggle to take action. When we say this is something in the future, this is going to be a problem in the future, we can't really focus on it enough to act or act enough. And I don't think that bio is an existential thing. I think that bio is real. We're here today. It's not abstract. It's concrete. And it is happening. Now, 10 years ago, I published this piece on five commandments for the bio revolution. And when you say 10 years ago and revolution, that already <laughs> raises a few questions. Maybe I was a little bit ambitious in the whole revolution piece, although I still hear people using that. These were my five commandments. I think they still stand. The last one is less discussed these days. Certainly in Europe, 10 years ago, there was a lot of concern about GMO, about the molecules, about the E. coli and the whatever, that it was genetically modified. That, that is not so much in the public consciousness now. But I think that the others still stand. If you want the article, my email is there. You can email me for the article. I'll send it to you. And also, what I'm doing now, instead of always working on long-term contracts for clients, I'm only one person. I've only got so much time. I'm making it possible for people to just book an hour with me. So come and talk to me about that or send me an email, and we can, you know, we can put that in place. Greenwashing. I can't talk about communications or storytelling without touching on greenwashing. I set up my firm 15 years ago as an anti-greenwashing firm. Because a lot of times it wasn't intended, maybe, but it was just a lack of understanding from companies in what they were communicating. There was lots of like green pictures, lots of babies and butterflies, and it was just not okay. So I decided I had to take that on. Obviously, single-handedly, I didn't manage to completely eradicate <laughs> greenwashing. I tried. Um, but what we're seeing now, there's so much fear about greenwashing and about legislation coming on greenwashing that we're moving to green hushing. Have you heard of green hushing? It's like when we say, shh, hush. So people are afraid now. They're afraid to make claims around any kind of green performance. And it's not helped by cancel culture. I've been talking for years now about visibility and credibility. Like this is my whole thing. This is my whole like life's work or something. If you only have visibility, you potentially have hype. If you have visibility with no credibility behind you, you are running the risk of greenwashing, you are gonna get into trouble, and legislation is coming, so that trouble is actually gonna be meaningful trouble. But flip that around, if you only have credibility, we're so good, we're so green, we're so holy, but nobody knows who you are, that you're there, what you are first, so no visibility, that doesn't work either. And you're not going to be surprised to hear that green hypocrisy exists. This is an extract from uh, coverage of a recent study done by Google where you know, company execs admitted to double standards in terms of greenwashing. But what happens when we are afraid to get it wrong. Anybody who's a parent might relate to this. We're afraid to get it wrong. We be can become frozen. We can become basically paralyzed. Because 
if you're going to get in trouble for doing it, better not do it. And that is that I'm seeing that coming more and more to the fore these days. But we move out of paralysis by action. And action, we can build our muscle in terms of action by, by learning, by training, by getting help, by bringing in the right support. And just taking it step by step, we make one small claim, we test out some messages, nothing got, you know, nothing went wrong, nothing came down on us, and so we can carry on. I don't want to run down my industry <laughs> and the communications professionals and maybe some of them in the room, but honestly, it's not as hard as it looks. It was probably a really dumb thing to say. I would say that I know the sector really well. I've got a sustainability background, so like I'm maybe not the same as every other like normal communicator. But I want to give you some guidelines and show you that it's really not that hard to get it right, which I hope will build confidence and will allow you to act. So in terms of guidelines, number one, and feel free to take pictures of any of my slides. It's totally OK. First of all, be honest. Well, that doesn't really sound that radical. But at the same time, we've seen that green hypocrisy exists. Be honest doesn't mean tell everything. You know, your technology business, you have got things that you don't want to tell. That is quite normal. Your secret source should remain your secret source. But you can be honest about what your material does, what it doesn't do, how quickly you can get to scale, what kind of scale you can get to, what you need to get there, this kind of thing. It's obvious, I think. But we need to be honest and we need to be clear. Um, we've seen too much hype, and hype is bringing the industry down. So I'm not saying don't do visibility. Clearly, there's that balance, but we can't be too hyped. Be inclusive, because many, many people have really had enough of being told what to do by old white men. So we need to be inclusive in our messaging. And also, we need to inspire hope. But I want you to keep in mind that hope without action is basically delusion. All right, so how are we going to do it? First of all, your audiences. I hate to break it to you, but a lot of you that work with big marketing or advertising agencies, you might be aiming higher than you need to. Do we need to get the Financial Times and the New York Times right now for one company's product? Sure, it's nice if we can get it, but I don't think that we actually need to get it. I think we need the trade press, we need to be at the events, we need to be talking to the customers and the partners here and elsewhere. So be prepared to lower the bar. It's a bit of a strange thing to say, maybe, but I stand by this because we are wasting a lot of time in trying to get the big, the big headlines in the big publications. Cover your bases means like don't be too clever. You don't need to be too clever about your messaging, about your science. Just like keep it really simple. There's a fear of dumbing down, but we can keep it simple. Take care of your story and your communications. Everything you do is communications. I give my business card to people almost every time they say, oh, that's a nice card. It's covering the bases. It's communications. And I think that we're past the stage of trying to do it all by ourselves. We need to be addressing this collectively. Collective means the whole industry. It means partnering with society, with government. It's not about the individual superstars anymore. And I want to see thought leadership, which is centered around change. And it's not just about the rock star, superstar, individual company, but that it speaks for the industry in a much more collective way and inspires collective action. I know I have a lot of slides. So I see a new climate cycle from the ones I mentioned before. We need to inspire. We need to inspire hope. We need to inspire people to take action. So maybe you can judge my storytelling today. It was a little rushed, I know, because I wanted to cover a lot. But these are some of the pointers that I would make. Self-deprecating humor, I'm English, it's the only kind we know. Um, expertise, maybe I gave you the idea that I know what I'm talking about. Empathy, we're in this together, this is hard, but we can do it. Um, a call to action, email me if you want the thing. Um, scarcity, we have to be careful, that can go against inclusivity, but I said like I have this thing that I'm doing now at WBM. Um, make it personal and allow for hope and inspiration to, to grow. We can plant the seeds for people to then connect to a vision of a different world, a better world. And above all, be human, be real. There's no time anymore for all the shininess that we've seen. Like time is running out, the house is on fire, so we need to act. 
Uh, if this is something that you're interested in, I've got uh, an online training because I had to rush through this. There's a lot more that I can share with you and you can come with your questions, which I think could be really, really helpful. Final thought, storytelling is for everyone. I already said like when you give your card to somebody, when you meet somebody, uh, you know, even in the hotel at breakfast, it's, everything is like your story, it's your communications, it's how you come across. Don't silo communications and story with the communications team. It's for everyone. And, and when was the last time you actually posted about me? Come on, you know that's professional suicide. Yeah, but you're constantly posting about the millions that you're giving to green energy. What do you want me to do? Post about the billions I give you every year? He'll tell everyone now that he loves renewables. And then he turns around to me and tells me that he loves me. Well, which is it? Well, obviously it's you. It's always been you. I would love to talk more. I would love to hear from you. Um, let's have a chat on the floor. Come to some training. You know, get, get me on the phone for an hour. We'll look at your communications, your story, and see you know, if there are any tweaks that need to be made. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.